fame is a cocktail. You can't drink it when you're thirsty. Producer, black eyed pea. Will I am? Yo, my man, I got a plan to do it all. And I forgot the rest. When did you start to feel it really blowing up? Do you say you've always had an entrepreneurial spirit? Anyone in the hood has an entrepreneurial spirit. We made more money from 30 seconds than making an hour and a half of music. We thought we were the shit. How was that on your mental health? Um, your moment is a short moment. And the moment you start feasting on fame, it will intoxicate you. Eventually, you're not gonna be famous. And then what? You're gonna be depressed. Beats with Dre. You wanna be a part of it? Once you had that idea, how did you make it happen? Uh, when did Beats sell the company to HTC? Beats sold to HTC in August 2011 for a whopping $300 million. <laughs> Lots to do. I've just been planning out my day. However, with Revolut as my main account, I've got one less thing to worry about, money. I know my money's safe with Revolut, so I can focus on other important matters like planning a wedding. That is why I pay with Revolut. If Revolut detects anything suspicious with your transfer, you'll receive an in-app warning straight away. And how cool is this? You create a single use card in the app with just one tap. And then after the purchase is made, your details disappear immediately. So they cannot be reused. Now, if you happen to lose or misplace your card, which is never a fun time for anyone, but a surprisingly regular occurrence for me, you can freeze your card instantly through the Revolut app. And if there's anything I do need help with, Revolut's customer service team are on hand 24 seven via the in-app chat. It is a huge reassurance for me and just one of the many reasons why Revolut is the main account for all of my finances. But don't just take my word for it, over 35 million people around the world trust Revolut with their money. Join us and create your account today. It is a big one. Today on Working Hard, Hardly Working, we have the one, the only, Will I Am. He is a multi-platinum artist. He's won nine Grammys, an Emmy, and is an all-round incredible musician, both as part of the Black Eyed Peas and as a music producer. But what you might not know is that he's also a tech entrepreneur and has been leading and investing in tech companies for over a decade now, including being one of the founding investors in such a huge company and what ended up to be an enormous, very big news deal in Beats by Dre. I wanted to speak to Will today about kind of navigating two separate intertwined but simultaneous careers. It is such an honor to have Will on the podcast. I'll be honest with you that I was... No, I was a little bit starstruck. And it is so clear from talking to him how much of a purely creative person he is. Please, if you do enjoy this episode, make sure to like and subscribe or rate or literally whatever it is on the current platform that you are on. It helps the podcast, it helps us get amazing guests and most importantly, it helps my ego. I hope you really enjoyed this episode just as much as I enjoyed making it. There are some truly fantastic gems of moments in here. And I really enjoyed speaking to Will so clear, as I said, just how creative he is. And I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed recording it. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. I always like to ask guests what they believe their like formative experiences were. What do you feel those experiences were for you? School, elementary school, finding out what my superpower was in school. And that was like my creativity and uh, my teachers that I had, my classmates, my neighborhood that I grew up in. But it wasn't, <clears throat> there's not one like, Yo, that one time when I was like coming home from school, it's not a one particular thing. It's like that developmental time, the rite of passage becoming, going from adolescent to teenage, that, and that school, going to school really, really helped develop the things I'm into now, tech, music, expressing myself, because that's, that's how I really got through school. I know for a lot of people who are like, as you say, your superpower was being creative. I know that school's not always the easiest for people whose superpower is creativity because it's based around kind of academic performance. Was school easy in that way for you? Or did you find it a struggle because your concentration was more on creativity? It, I was lucky to have awesome teachers and I loved asking questions. I was a guy that's like, ooh, 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 me, come on, come on, me, 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 me. I just always liked asking questions or answering them and putting my creativity, my curiosity, and my pattern matching to the test. I was never shy of raising my hand. I love that. Still to this day, I do that. I'll be in meetings and I'll be like, they're like, you don't have to raise your hand, Will. I'm like, 
Yes, I do. Because then I'm going to talk like- over you. And then like, <laughs> you're going to think I'm rude. Especially in group settings. Mm. With those like five, six people talking. And I'm noticing that people are talking over one another. Then I'll raise my hand and try to set the tone of like letting other people complete their thoughts. Mm. <clears throat> but school, school taught, school taught me all that. And I brought those, the things that I loved about that to my adulthood and my practice. But creativity, my teachers really encouraged that. And what areas of creativity did they kind of encourage? Was it specifically kind of, did you realize first that you were artistic or musical or generally creative? Just generally creative. Mm. <clears throat> Applying that creativity and in, in writing, um, how I, the questions I would ask, um, like pushback on, hey, but wait a second. If that, if you said that last week and you're saying this this week, well, shouldn't it be this? Like that type of like pattern matching and, and pushing back. And would you say you've always had a kind of entrepreneurial spirit? I think anyone in the hood has an entrepreneurial spirit <clears throat> because they're surviving. And whether you're surviving in life or you're surviving in business and trying to find new ways to survive, that's entrepreneurial. You know, there's a lot of similarities in um, survival and going from ideation to manifestation to, you know, scaling. It's about the the art of surviving. And you talk <clears throat> about your neighborhood and growing up where you did as a very important part of who you are and kind of you say that it was important in like developing your entrepreneurialism but also you mentioned it as kind of one of the important formative experiences could you talk to me a little bit about I guess where you grew up and what that neighborhood was like I grew up in an all-Mexican neighborhood we were the, we were the, one of the only black families there. It was beautiful to be around a different culture. Well, it's the only culture I knew growing up. So being around that beautiful culture. Um, and then going to all white school and having being, you know, being raised in an all Mexican neighborhood. And on surface to folks, they probably thought I came from all black neighborhood. So when I spoke in a Mexican accent, they thought maybe I was from Dominican Republic or Panama. Because very rarely do, you know, African Americans sound Mexican. Um, and then dressing the way I dressed in school because we were poor and having, uh, you know, wearing suits to school and secondhand um, suits to school, they probably thought like, why, one, why do you talk that way? Why are you dressed that way? So that, that I was, my, my uh, foundation gave me my uniqueness. My uniqueness was not like, hmm, I'm gonna do this. It, it wasn't contrived, it wasn't thought of, it was, just the circumstances. Like, um, before I traveled, if you would have met me, I would, I would, if I go back home to my neighborhood, it'll be like, hey, what's up, fool? Ah, not even, dog. I, hey, I came here last week because last week I wanted to go shopping, but you weren't even here, fool. So, like, why don't we get together, like, next week, fool? Not even, fool. No mama's way. Like, that's how I talk. This was my accent before I started traveling. Everyone was like, hey, why you talk like that, Willie? Well, this is how I talk. But, hablo español? Claro que sí. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué mi barrio? Todos mis uh, amigos, mi, mi familia habla español mucho. That's how we, that's how my family spoke. And then I started traveling and my accent changed. But 
I love my neighborhood. It I, made me who I am. It's why I make the music I make, the style of music I make. And so you talk there in a few different instances of how you felt different from each setting. So whether you were in the neighborhood, you say you were in an all-Mexican neighborhood, and you, when you were at school, you were at an all-white school. And then all-black church. Right. So my black friends would be like, you crazy fool, why you talk like a Mexican? Like, what do you mean? This is how I was raised. And it's beautiful. How do you feel that being, as you say, kind of different in each of those settings, how do you feel like that affected you as a kid? I'm so happy I was raised in the 90s. Because if I was raised in the 2000s, then you had the whole world's opinion in your face on your phone. And because of that, I think a lot of people are not tolerant to perspective. They want everything to be the way they want it to be. You can turn off notifications. You can block people. You can... Uh, how you block somebody in real life? <laughs> it's called a uh, restraining order. <laughs> but... <laughs> to get a restraining order, they had to have done some pretty bad things to you for the police to be like, you can't come five miles uh, around this person or this community. That's how, that's a real block in real life. In real life, you can't block somebody. Yes, you cannot look at them when they talk to you, you do all this. Will, it's a, it's a lot of effort. So in the 90s, you either had to deal with the BS or you had mm -hmm. to remove the BS. And by removing the BS is to make sense of the BS. So you, you're a lot more tolerant to BS. It gives you thicker skin. And if somebody made fun of you, then you needed, you needed, you needed to up your skills on making fun back. <laughs> like, look at this fool. You need some, look at your knuckles. Were you punching the walls? Like, oh, oh, my knuckles are kind of scarred. Well, look at your knees, fool. What you, you running on your kneecaps? So that is was that was my upbringing. Somebody made fun of you, you made fun of them back. It was jokes. And we had a really good time identifying our flaws, living with our flaws, and then pointing out somebody else's flaws in hopes they could deal with their flaws and either adjust them or live with them, accept them. My flaws are what make me unique. Um, and I'm happy I was raised in the 90s. It was a no disrespect to people raised in the 2000s or the teens, but the 90s, and I'm pretty sure the people that was raised in the 70s or the 80s were like, yo, we are the 80s. We started the computer shit. The 70s are like, yo, Sugar boogers, we invented cocaine, snorting. <laughs> like, that's the 70s. The 80s are like, yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? We with the 80s. The 60s was like marijuana, free love. 50s were like, yo, rock and roll. 40s were like, we just finished the war. 30s were like, I don't know what the fuck the 30s were. <laughs> 20s were like, <laughs> roaring 20s, we are partying alcohol, bitches, what? The 10s were like, electricity, motherfuckers, <laughs> airplanes. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, like 80s, the 90s, growing up in the 90s was like, yo, samplers, MTV, right? TRL, hip hop, everywhere. 90s was dope. And how do you feel you'd be different if you were brought up a decade later and had your career with, I guess, starting where social media was already very much a 2000s, thing? 2000s, like the internet, bitches, what? Internet. 2000 kids. They're dope. 2010 kids, social media. We're going to look back at social media and be like, wow, what in the hell did these kids have to go through with all this hate in their face, all this perversion everywhere, all this distortion, algorithmic algorithm chasing, 
what? Wow. And you, then you're going to salute all those kids that grew up in the teens. If you're like 12 in 2013 and you, what? And now you're freaking 22 in 2023? 20, right? What? That was a, that was a ride. And how do you think your career would have been different if social <clears throat> media had been at the beginning of it? Oh, oh, I'm really happy that my career started in the 90s and we sold records in the 2000s because making a career in streaming, although everyone has access to be able to do it, it's not like the golden era of like the success of Lionel Richie, Michael Jackson, Prince, that type of success versus this stuff. It's light years as far as income. Kings and queens of streaming versus kings of queens of recording and broadcast. The kings of queens of recording and broadcast never really saw the importance of being a mogul and bringing other products to life. Mm. Your product was selling that record or CD. This, the streaming kings and queens are like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm probably not making that much money on the streams compared to the sales. But you see my makeup line, though? Yeah. Oh, you see my uh, my sparkling beverage line? You see my champagne line? You see my fragrance line? That wasn't the thought process of the recording broadcast. Jimi Hendrix was recording. He played the shit out of the guitar. Prince was, too. If they were in this generation, Jimi Hendrix would be selling Hendrix guitars. Prince would be selling Prince guitars, not just playing a Gibson or a Fender bass. He would have his own guitars. Michael Jackson would have had his own penny loafer shoes, not just wearing penny loafer shoes. He would have made his own glittery freaking diamond socks, and he would have collaborated with Swarovski. <laughs> or... De Beers or Cartier or Tiffany. Are those Michael Jackson Tiffany socks? Oh, I love the Michael Jackson Tiffany collab. Oh my gosh, I got them too. I got the black diamonds. Right? That would have been if Mike was around in this era. And you've kind of actually straddled both of those in a way because you've obviously been very much part of the sales era, but also you've done a huge amount of entrepreneurial kind of work. Where did that all start for you? Like even going back to like the Beats by Dre founding investment, mm. how did that even come about? Oh, so like when you're successful in music in the 90s, 2000s, <laughs> people are watching it and they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, he's like old. <laughs> <laughs> he's putting out music in the 90s. Oh my gosh. Anyways, so... <laughs> So back in the 2000s, <laughs> um, Nokia and BlackBerry wanted the Black Eyed Peas to help them sell their products. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a curious, I'm always curious. Hey, I got a question. Like, how much did it cost to make this product that we're helping you sell? Wait, what? It only costs, get out of here. Three million bucks to develop this product? And now you're so, wait, how is it $3 million to develop it, but I bought it for this much money? Because I'm curious. Then we help sell, actually, we first started sell. we help sell Dr. Pepper, which is a drink. And I asked that same question, you know, how much does it cost to make a bottle that we're selling, helping you sell? Because you guys paid us all this money for a 30 second commercial. And we made more money from 30 seconds than making an hour and a half of music with four videos. That's crazy to me. So 30 seconds of an advert for a brand versus our product, which is a CD with 15 songs on it. And each video we do is for like four minutes long. How The math don't work. 30 seconds got us this. An hour and four videos got this. This shit don't make no sense. So that type of thinking made me realize that, yeah, we are a band, but we're not a brand. Yeah, we have a product, but it's not really a product. And we only sell shirts 
at a show, how come our shirts don't sell at Nordstrom's or at a store? Why is it only at the venue at our concert? Like our shirts are just as cool as those shirts that are at Target. Who would, what's that brand and why are they thinking? And the only brand that was doing that at the time was Kiss and the Rolling Stones. You can buy a Kiss and a Rolling Stone shirt at a regular store outside of the concert. So I started seeing these patterns of like how brands work, how bands work. So one year I come home from tour and I tell Jimmy like, yo, let's make our own hardware. Let's use our music to sell our own stuff. Why are we selling everybody else's stuff? Let's sell our own stuff. It's 2006. So in 2007, he's like, Beats with Dre. <laughs> you want to be a part of it? I remember the conversation that we had about selling our own stuff. Um, there's more context to that, but I'm not going to get into like the details of our combo. But I'm mm. like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll be down. I'll get down. What do you want me to do? We just need your brain, your curiosity, your imagination. It's like, I'm all in. Um, I pitched other ideas to companies, like I pitched a, a concept to Coca-Cola. My pitch was simple. I like making pitch decks. Like, oh, imagine we could do this. It's going to do that. Oh, no, make it like this. I just love making pitch decks to get the idea out and then go into a company and pitching it or investors and pitching it. To me, that's like making an album. It's a pitch for a sonic Escape. Like, no, 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 no. The bass gotta go boom, do do doom 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 boom, do do doom doom doom, do do doom doom doom, bam 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 boom. That's a pitch. Like, that's how I see the sound. That's how I hear the sound. It's in my head. I want to get it out into the world. I want you to be like singing what I got in my head. It's a pitch. It's a concept. Hey, why don't we all sing the same song? Right? So that same type of like, designing something, whether it's frequencies and tempo and melody, it's with imagery and shapes and geometry or concepts um, and synchronization of thought. And so I pitched this idea to Coke and I, I, was a, I had like the perfect sentence, like, yo, what's my elevator pitch? Because I remember people should be like, yo, What's your elevator pitch? I was like, what the fuck is an elevator pitch? Like, you know, if you're in an elevator, you got a certain amount of time to pitch it. I was like, yeah, but what if it, what if the floors like got a hundred floors? That's different than an elevator pitch in like four floors. It was like, yeah, so keep it short for a three floor building. Oh, damn it. All right. And so I got my elevator pitch down for my Coca-Cola concept. I'm like, yo, B Perez. Companies the size of Coke need to be verbs in society. If you don't believe me, Google it. She's like, wow, Google is a verb. I'm like, right? Coke should be a verb too. Well, what do you think Coke's verb should be? Coke in reverse. E-K-O-C for eco-cycle, eco-community, eco-concept, eco creativity, eco-collaboration. We're going to take your waste, which is plastic and aluminum. We're going to create a new base cloth and we're going to license that base cloth to other companies to execute their sustainability efforts. So eco-cycle, are those eco-cycle Levi jeans? That's the verb. The process of transformation and making it uh, reusable and sustainable because waste is only waste when you waste it. So I have a whole like concept down like, yo, check that out, right? Eco-cycle, Eek, which is coke backwards, and it's a verb, and waste is only waste when you waste it, so let's not waste it, let's renew it, renew it reuse it. I pitched this to them in 2008. It took us a year and a half or two years to get the deal on who owns coke in reverse. I was like, but I came up with the concept. I, come, I can't. So I fought, fought, fought. So we, so we ended up where no one can own it if we're not partnered. They can't do anything with it if we're not doing something around sustainability. So I love pitch decks. I pitched the concept to uh, a football player friend of mine. His name is Jamal Anderson. He played for the Atlanta Falcons, American football. One day I'm like, yo, I want to do a soundtrack to your feet. He's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, think about it, bro. Everybody does soundtracks to movies. 
What about soundtrack to your feet? He's like, well, what are you freaking going on about? I was like, well, hear me out. How many weeks is your training to go and play pro? He was like, it's 12 weeks. 12 weeks, right? So for each week, I'm going to make a song for each mode of training that you do. Because your feet, you need your feet to play your sport. It's called football, bro. So I'm going to make a soundtrack to your feet. You're probably going to get a shoe deal, right? So instead of the songs, the 12 songs, which is an album, being sold at um, uh, Tower Records or Virgin Megastore, we're going to sell them at Foot Locker. Selling music at a shoe store because you're going to have a shoe. And it's soundtrack to your feet, which is really the freaking theme songs and commercials to your shoe that's going to be sold, bro. Brilliant. So he was like, yo, all right, let's do it. I'm like, wait, wait, really? So I was, we, I was signed up to do it. He gets hurt. So I'm like, dang it. My whole concept is gone. And so then I went to my friend. I'm like, yo, let's do a soundtrack to a beer. And so we went to, we flew to Colorado. There's a beer called Coors. I met with the Coors family. This is 2003. I flew to Colorado, had a whole pitch, made a pitch deck. I'm like, yo, I want to make a soundtrack to your beer. And so they're like, we're not in the music business. I'm like, yes, you are. I don't know one bar that doesn't play music where people aren't drinking your product and listening to music for free. Who's going to go to a bar that doesn't play music? And what do they go to bars for? To buy music or buy your product? So you are in the music business. You just don't know it. Because without music, your product doesn't get sold at certain locations. So they, they love my concept. They gave me the gig. And if you go on iTunes right now, there's an album up there called Must Be 21. Because in America, that's the age for drinking. There's a song in there called um, Let's Do It. It was originally supposed to be called Let's Get Started, but they wanted me to change the title to Let's Do It. Um, and then we eventually released a different version of Let's Get Started. There's an artist on that compilation, must be 21, by the name of John Stevens. John Stevens' legal name is John Stevens. His artist name that he became after that project is called John Legend. There's a person by the name of Stacy that's on that project that then became Fergie. So this Must Be 21 record was a soundtrack to a beer. But because the beer company funded it, they're not in the music business. So I ended up owning the masters to something they paid for. Fucking crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> I always had this like, you know, looking at what what's happening from an elevated view to then make sense of it and be creative and curious and pitch and uh, fearless. What's the worst going to happen? You pitch something and somebody's like, nah. So the whole premise of it is to come up with the perfect pitch. And when did you start realizing that actually kind of entrepreneurship was very much part of your job as a musician? Obviously you were in the founding investment for Beats by Dre. Did you expect that to go as well as it did? No, you you never do. You just try your best to make it work, like writing songs like Boom Boom Pow, where the product is right there in the bridge. I be rocking them beats. And in the video, I'm like wearing the Beats headphones. Um, one of the first videos that had the beats in them. Um, but over pronouncing it by putting it in the song because I learned from like my Adidas. I learned from like Passacavassier. The difference between the two is they didn't own Adidas and they didn't own Cavassier. While Beats, you're owner of. And so when you say, I be rocking them, it's like, it's a different, it's a different level of like, this is my shit. So emphasis on, mm, I be rocking them, them, this is ours. Mm. And so as part of this, when did you realize that actually that type of entrepreneurship and that type of ownership as a whole 
was actually what was going to get you to the next level in terms of your career, in terms of what you actually owned versus music? Oh, well, before Beats, I was already out trying to invest in things. So I invested in a Tesla before the Beats. A right around Beats, I invested in Twitter, but then sold my Twitter later on. But I always was out looking for things to be a part of or invest in or, I don't know, always had this like, there's a rap that I wrote when I was uh, on our first album, that curious men mentality. So Black Eyed Peas at one point in time were an underground group, and I still consider us an underground spirit, especially nowadays where nothing's underground in the digital realm. Right. But I always had this perspective of wanting to know more. Mm. So there's a lyric that I wrote and um, on our first album that came out in 1998 on a song called A8. And uh, the lyric goes, yo, my man, I got a plan to do it all. I got a plan that none of y'all ever thought about because underground don't be thinking I'm going continental like Lincoln. How could you make moves when you always trap under? I'm trying to reach the surface to learn more about the thunder. I wonder what really makes the world go round. Not thugs, because thugs go round to bring other brothers down to be in it for a quick blink. But when you stop to think, you'll be deep with... I forgot the rest. <laughs> but yes, that wonder, that curiosity of like, yo, who made that? Is that They just put the air conditioning ducts outside and want to encage it in it? That's pretty cool. I wonder what company that is. I, I always like <laughs> wanting to know, like, hey, what's this company? Cord is this? Green Stag. I just like to know what I'm interfaced with. What am I around? What materials is this? Is this made in China, Taiwan? Probably so. Mm. So a real kind of curiosity for everything. Yeah. Back to my elementary, like what got me through school, mm. that curious mindset, like asking questions. For example, if you don't know something, a lot of times people are afraid to admit they don't know. If they don't understand something, they're afraid to admit they don't understand it. So last year I I attended, I enrolled to go to Harvard because I just want to know more about business. So now I attend Harvard Business School. And so everything was going smooth sailing. I'm like, wow, back at school, raising my hand, like, what? This feels great. Now it was like heavy finance. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't digest what the lesson was. And I'm like, I felt defeated. Like, dang, I can't wrap my head around this. No matter what angle I came from, I called the, my my finance department uh, for my personal finance. It's like, yo, I don't understand this, Thomas. So Thomas like, well, well, here's the reason why. Look at it from this perspective. I was like, yeah, but I that's why I hired your firm to handle my finance. I don't understand this stuff. I understand the basics, but I need to do spreadsheets. So I go to class the next day. I'm like, Professor Dawes, I just want to let you know, like, if you call on me today, there's a lot of things I don't understand about this. And um, yeah, I just want to let you know. So he pulls me back. He says, you know, what? well, not that I was expecting you to know it. Do you think any of your classmates came to me and told me that they didn't know it? The fact that you are that you're aware that you're having problems understanding it means you're going to know how to hire the right people for your business because that's part of knowing is knowing when to delegate and trust in somebody that does. And that's what Harvard Business School is all about. It's not about you trying to know everything. It's about you being comfortable with knowing what you don't know and then reinforcing that. And so thanks for coming and um, wait, so wait, lesson, I, I passed this class. <laughs> so I passed that, I, I didn't pass that class, but to me it was a reinforcement and it's a lesson like, it's okay not to know. You just have to know who to bring in your fold that knows and then trust in that person's expertise. And so how have you made sure that you've kept like the right people around you and like hired the right types of people? Trust. You know, you have to trust in the people you hire. You have to be patient in how they fit into the dream that either you're the dream ideator, you're the one who ideated the and manifested the dream and now you have to go out and hire people to materialize and lift up that dream and if you do that then you have to trust in the people to call the shots where they feel they're going to contribute and you as soon as you start questioning them 
then you're going to close them up. Then they're never going to feel like, um, there's no need for me to bring this up because they don't, you, you have to let your Michael Jordan be your Michael Jordan. You have to let your Scottie Pippen be your Scottie Pippen. You need to allow for your David Beckhams to be your David Beckhams. Your stars are going to shine when you give them room to shine. And the moment you start stifling their their concepts or their contributions or suggestions, um, it all starts there. Like who you pick, who you elect, who you delegate to, and how you encourage them to bless you with their gifts, right? You got to, they're the talent. They're not employees. Nobody wants to feel like an employee. They want to feel like talent, talent, because talent is like irreplaceable if you're lucky enough to have like awesome talent around you. So on that, I'd love to hear a little bit about when you initially started, as you say, it was kind of underground and that was what, what it was, you know, that was where you were at at the time. When did you start to feel it all really blowing up? Um, I was in, I was in high school and the, uh, 11th grade when I got my first record deal. I was like 17 and I used to go to this rap contest um, when I was 16, 17 and freestyle battle. And that confidence came from my teachers and my friends. One time in health class, I was doodling on the desk and my teacher's name was Miss Montez and she was teaching health, sex ed. And I was like a weird, I've always been this like oddball kid. Um, I was zoning out into like my imagination world as class was going on, she knew I wasn't paying attention um, or I was hyper thinking multiple thoughts. So she was like, William, do you want to talk to us about the lesson today, which is reproduction? And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. And so then I recited a poem and the poem, went, I remember it, it was like impromptu and, and um, but then I remembered what I said in class and wrote it down. And the lyric was, it says everything to do with how I got a record deal, how I started my career. She said, William, do you want to um, give a summary on the class and what we're talking about as far as reproductive reproduction? So I'm like, yeah, of course, Miss Montez. I said, uh, when I arrived on planet Earth, my arrival was rugged, exiting the canals of the birth tubes. I struggled through tight walls. My fist balled up to the point where my strength transformed into lockjaw. These are emotions of a fetus dying to escape. So I began kicking the uterus. I'm trapped in a womb. There's no sharp object to puncture the blue liquidated room. And there's no oxygen. It's just liquid breath. Any sound I make don't be nothing because it can't escape the walls of flesh. My cries for help seem to ricochet, sinking in the cell cavities. I need a remedy. And so she's like, wow, William, <laughs> what was that about? I was like, that's probably the emotion of every child that's in a womb screaming to get out. And no one hears its cries. Fist balled up, clenched, till the strength transforms into lockjaw. These are emotions of a fetus dying to escape. So I began kicking the uterus. I'm trapped in a womb. There's no sharp object to puncture the blue liquidated room. And there's no oxygen. It's just liquid breath. Any sound I make don't be nothing because it can't escape the walls of flesh. My cries for help seem to ricochet. Sinking in the cell cavities, I need a remedy. And so I passed health class with that poem because it's a different perspective. Yeah, I could have tried to learn what's in the textbook, but that doesn't mean I absorbed it. I'm just reciting the textbook. But if I could use it in a metaphor, well, then I really absorbed it. If I could paint a different picture, a different perspective, now I really absorbed it down to an emotional level. And so... Miss Montez gave me an A. I was like, yeah, didn't even have to read it. <laughs> Which is, I might encourage people not to read textbooks if you're in class, but just expand your imagination and, and learn something. Use what you learned and speak it in a metaphor, a simile. And so from that, that gave me this other level of like fearlessness and uh, self-awareness and belief in myself that I started going to these freestyle battles and battling rappers. And then that got, gave me my record deal with um, uh, Easy e He started a group called NWA. They had songs like Fuck the Police. Yeah, Straight Outta Compton. 
And that's who discovered me when I was 17 years old. And there was a TV show called 90210 uh, in the 90s. And there's a guy by the name of Brian Austin Green, who's like the star of the show, one of the stars. And when they weren't filming, they used to let me, he used to let me record in his in the studio home. So we had like all the Hollywood friends, um, but we would hang out at, at underground like jazz clubs and uh, instead of going to Hollywood clubs. And so, yeah, that's how we, we started. We we're a little LA misfits. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio was, was our high school friend, went to photography class with Apple, the guy that I started Black Eyed Peas with. So we were just like immersed in Hollywood teenage talent, a talent pool. But we didn't want to just, you know, be typical Hollywood. So we really like going to like jazz spots. We were 17, 18, 19, 20, hanging out with 30, 40 year olds that played like jazz. And we thought we were like, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, we going to bar one. Oh yeah, I'm going over here to downtown on Vigness. First in Vigness, there's a cool little jazz spot down there. We're going to be on the mic. And all the freaking rich white girls from Palisades and Britain would be like, oh, my gosh, you guys are at what? At a jazz club? It's so cool. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool and shit. Uh, I got a fake ID. You got a fake ID? Because it's like 21 and over. And so we used to be, we were so like, we thought we were so like diff. And so when did you start to realize that it was like really blowing up, like really taking off? We thought we were blowing up from the beginning. What are you talking about? We were like, they know us at every college in LA. We play at Dominguez Hills, Long Beach, um, Irvine, USC, UCLA, Northridge, San Diego State, so Pasadena College. So in LA, we thought we were the shit because all the college kids knew Black Eyed Peas in 1996, 97, 98. Then we went on our first tour. We were like, yo, we are large, but we weren't. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, we were large. To us, we were large. And then people told us, you guys aren't big. I'm like, what do you mean we're not big? Well, you guys are opening act. You guys don't headline your own stuff. We're like, wait, what do you mean? Yeah, you guys don't do your own shows. You guys are opening acts. So then we were like, oh shit, we need to, we need to like have our own shows. We shouldn't be open. All yeah, right. Why are we opening up for other people? When are we going to headline our own stuff? Then, then we um, went on tour with Macy Gray. And I'm like, yo, what? You guys dang Macy? Because we kind of grew up with Macy Gray playing colleges and stuff. We started seeing her gravitas and her like magnetism here in the UK. You know, she would come here. She was like, I don't just play London. I play camp. I play Dartmouth. I mean, um, Bournemouth. Bournemouth? Yeah, it's another part of it's another part of the UK. Like everybody, when they go to UK, they just think London and sometimes Manchester. But I play Brixton in London, of course. But then I go to Kent. I go to um, Essex. I go to Sussex. I go to um, Newcastle. I'm like, dang, Macy, all these different... Damn, she was like, yeah, a lot. It's like people going to, it's like the equivalent where somebody coming from London and they think they come into America and they just play LA. That's not America, that's just LA. And that's the same with the UK. You gotta want, you wanna go to all these other places. So I'm like, wow. And so Macy was the one who told me like, yo, there's more to the UK than London. Cause America's, Americans, they just think like, yeah, we're going to London, we go to London, we just play the UK. Like, no, you play London. After learning that from Macy, I just wanted to go everywhere in the UK, you know, just want to travel throughout the whole entire country, not just London. And when it really started to kind of, you, you realized that it was kind of like international stardom, how was that on your mental health? Oh, with, oh, no, that didn't affect my mental health. No. No, because I have my best friends. To be like, you you know, we can't take none of this stuff seriously. Like if somebody comes up to us and says, oh my gosh, you're so great. That that could be poison. Because that means, how do you know if they're just, just saying that? Who's going to tell us when shit is bad? So we always got to just listen to us. And let's we always have to be honest to one another. All this other stuff, the praises, the hate, 
ignore that stuff. If somebody comes up to you and says, oh my gosh, you're so awesome. If you're going to take that seriously, that means when somebody says, oh my gosh, you suck. You got to take that seriously too. You can't pick which one you want to like hold precious. There's truth in you suck. There's truth in you're great. And so that kind of doesn't affect your mental health once you're grounded in reality. Mm. That's reality. Sometimes when people say you suck, you suck. Sometimes when people say that show was bad, it was probably bad. Sometimes when people say your show was great, it probably was great. Sometimes when they say that was the, the best show you've ever done, maybe, maybe, yeah, there's, yeah. But you got to be able to take them all. And we thought we were international with where's love. And then we realized that that wasn't truly international until we got to I Got a Feeling. And so every time is a new time. And then after that, we realized that I Got a Feeling was big, but not big like Ritmo and Mamacita. Because now people in the Latin world, they are now singing songs with us because we have chosen and dedicated ourselves to write songs in a different language with the same passion of writing in English. Um, and that gave us a different level of international appeal. So you were always able to stay pretty level-headed no matter how famous you guys got? Yeah, because fame is a cocktail. You can't drink it when you're thirsty. And the moment you start feasting on fame, it's gonna distort your perspective on life. So yes, fame is there, but do you start drinking it like it's like gonna quench your thirst when you're thirsty? No, it's an alcoholic beverage. It will intoxicate you. So you have to be very selective of how many sips of fame you take. You don't, and you don't wear it as a necklace. It's heavy, it's gonna rip the skin on your neck. It's just there, fame is cool. But it's not a cuddly, snuggle companion. Eventually, you're not going to be famous. And then what? You're going to be depressed. Fame is like a, you have a tamed panther or lion in your midst. Do you ride it like a horse? You probably shouldn't. Because eventually, that lion is going to get hungry. And although it's tamed, it will eat your ass. So you don't use it as a method of transportation. <laughs> It, the fame is there, but you don't, you're not, I, I don't like to like, no, I don't like that. How do you make sure you're keeping people you can trust by you? You know, like when you go into a tube or an airplane or a public place mm -hmm. and an old person walks in, an elderly person walks in, or you say, excuse me, do, do you want to take my seat? Like we, notice how everyone's voice becomes kind and gentle. Or if you, if an elderly person is lost or needs help, your voice tone changes to address the fragility, to be mindful and kind of what they need. And you put something above you. Very rarely, and the people that do do that, you know are dicks or assholes. If an elderly person is on a tube and you're sitting down and they come to you and say, excuse me, can I, can I take your seat? I'm sorry, ma'am, you see me sitting here. That's an asshole, right? It's clearly that that person is a dick and has no empathy. And that humbleness, you want to show up all the time, not just for elderly people, but for people. And if your friends that you have around you that you've selected have that humble heart where there's always going to be something above your level of success, that's temporary, by the way. And you don't know if the person that you came across is going to be your boss five years from now, or you're going to be dependent on them five years from now. Your moment is a short moment. And the objective is to be kind when you're here. So people are kind to you when you're here. And, and when you're around Hollywood, you see that up and down, you know, roller coaster all the time. People that used to be large eventually are not large. And on your way up, they're going to remember you on your way down of how you acted and how you you know treated people. And we've seen that. And I, I, I would say that I'm blessed to have the friends I have. So do you think it's been incredibly important to your success to stay humble? To stay humble meant I had an option to not be. I don't know how to not be mindful is the right word. Because mm. to stay humble is not humble. Like, y'all, I'm the most humblest motherfucker in the world. For real, though, ain't nobody more humbler than me. That's not humble. But to be mindful of your surroundings and the people that you come across, to realize that they have dreams, too. They have paths. Acknowledge everybody. 
when you walk into a room, when I say acknowledge everybody when they walk into when you walk into a room, acknowledge that they have dreams and maybe their dream, you could help them materialize that dream. Um, yeah, somebody did that to me. Somebody received me when they walked into a room and acknowledged me. Miss Montes, Jimmy Iving, Easy E. These people saw my dream. And so how do you, if you're, if you're a recipient of uh, that type of energy, are you going to duplicate and amplify that same energy that helped amplify you? That's what I like to be, that type of agent. So I want to talk about your move into tech. Um, and first of all, your new app. FYI, mm. could you tell me a little bit about what that is? Oh, FYI is a, a solution to the status on how creatives work on their phone. So there's a lot of creatives that have a WhatsApp, an iMessage, or a Telegram, and they work from it mm. because there's no software for creative enterprise, no matter what domain of creativity you create in, whether you're an illustrator. Um, a musician, a songwriter, um, a graphic designer. Mm. For some reason, we work from the messenger. And to work from the messenger, you need Dropbox and you need a WeTransfer. And to send large files and open large files, you're not opening those large files in the messenger. You have to then go to email to open up a large file. But you really can't send a large file on email, so you then you have to zip it and compress it. And so why are you doing all those different things if the phone tells you that you could send large files on some places and open large files in some places, but why are other components and compartments limited in scope? So it's like, yo, there needs to be a better messenger that allows you to send large files, open large files, keep all your digital asset, um, asset safe with digital asset management tools and keys that keep your data safe. Like how keys keep your cryptocurrency safe. Why can't it keep my data and my conversation safe? So FYI is a singular interface for creative communication, collaboration, digital asset management, and elliptical curve cryptography baked in the core to keep all your assets safe with generative AI at the center to help you supercharge your strategies and your creative company flow. And so... It's clear kind of how the idea came about. Once you had that idea, how did you make it happen? Like, how did you find the right people to build the tech? How mm. did you find the team to build it? When we sold Beats to HTC, when did Beats sell um, the company to HTC? What year was that? Beats sold to HTC in August 2011 for a whopping $300 million. This deal was pretty big news at the time as it allowed HTC to incorporate Beats audio technology into its smartphones. Interestingly, the co-founder of Beats, Dr. Dre, was a big part of the deal as his name recognition and reputation helped to boost the value of the brand. It's crazy to think that a company that started as a small audio company eventually sold for $300 million. Well, there we go. So 2011. So when we sold it in 2011, I took my portion of my earnings and I went to go find teams. Because around this time, Jimmy was like, you know, one day you're going to realize that being the talent, you should be collecting talent. I'm like, wait, what? You collected us? I'm a part of your collection of talent? Oh, wow. That's freaking dope. I never thought of that. I never thought that Jimmy collected talent like Dre, myself. Collect is a harsh word. Curated talent. So I was like, you know what? I want to curate talent too. But I don't want rappers and beat makers. I want to rock with developers. So I went to Bangalore, India and Israel to find developers, to create solutions around 2012. And so I knew where to go. I started building AI solutions in 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. Sold a couple of companies and technologies to big companies with the work that we were doing in Bangalore and, and Israel. And so in 2020, when I had the idea for FYI, I knew where to go to materialize the idea. I knew what talent that was out there. Um, and it was a small team that was put together to materialize the vision of a singular interface, creative enterprise communication collaboration platform. 
I talk about productivity a lot and I think productivity is incredibly important in terms of, you know, getting the most out of your day to day. I do also think that productivity can sometimes be a kind of antidote to creativity. Like it's tough to create in a pre-assigned time. How do you balance being productive and being creative? Being creative. I don't believe in writer's block. People that are crippled by this concept of writer's block are hard on themselves. They're the ones that have put themselves in creative paralysis and they don't use time as an agent or a gravity to get the idea out. I like to use it if I'm ever having a block, which I don't, is I use time. Like, you know, I got 30 minutes. Whatever I make in 30 minutes is what I make. And however it is, is however it is. There's no need to judge it. Why am I going to judge it? I have to release it. And I got 30 minutes to do it. Go. And that, and whatever I do in that time is what I do in that time. Or, uh, and that exercise, later on, you'll be like, oh, wow, there was some gems that came out of that little exercise. There was some really cool stuff because your, your mind is critical for a lot of reasons. Maybe you're going through relationship problems. Maybe you're bloated. Maybe you've ate some food and you're not liking the way you're feeling right now. So now you're internalizing on things that are happening in inside your mind. You're being extra critical when you shouldn't be critical because no matter if it's good or bad, somebody's going to like it. If you think it's really great, you're going to have a heartbreak when somebody says that shit's horrible. So who are you creating for in the first place? Are you creating for yourself? For you to like it? Are you creating for other people? For other people to like it? Or are you just creating for therapy to get it out? And that's the healthy way for me to go about creating. I got this idea. I don't care what it is. It's just for Coca-Cola Company. I got to get it out. If they like it, great. If they don't, whatever. I still got it out. I executed this idea. And that, that comes with no boulder. That comes with no stress. If you create from that perspective, it's like a sponge. Imagine a sponge like, man, I'm just not feeling it today. I don't know how to release all this water I sponged up. A sponge, you'll never hear a fucking sponge complaining about that shit. As a matter of fact, you probably never talk to a sponge to know how a sponge feels. All you know that a sponge absorbs and when you do this, it comes out. And if it doesn't come out, it's not a sponge. It's a rock. Now, which one are you? Are you a rock? Or are you a sponge? I'm a sponge. I absorb, I rinse out. There's no judgment. If you like it, great. If you don't, cool. My job is a sponge. And so you think it's incredibly important to be, I guess, kind to yourself when in like at the creative process, like not judging what you're putting out. Anything that comes out is worth that kind of creativity. Is that right? It's therapy for me. Yo, there's some shit that's going on in my head right now. I don't want to have anxiety. I don't want to panic. I got to let this stuff out. I got to write about this heartbreak. This girl fucked my whole life up right now. That's how I feel this fucking turn inside out. I got to write this stuff out. Whew, I feel so much better. Look at that. Look at this. Po- oh my gosh, I can't believe I wrote that. Dang, girl. You really inspired me right now. Next time you break my heart, that's a source of inspiration. I ain't going to be freaking... I'm not going to be tripping no more. It's like, I'm about to make money because all the time this chick buck uh, gets on my ass, it turns into gold. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It'd be like, you got a significant other, she gets on your nerves and you're you're fighting. That's fuel. (laughs) That's some, uh, I know that's, that. now that's selfish. She'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you started fights just so you could go in the studio and write some songs. (laughs) But I don't do that. (laughs) I want to talk quickly before we end about AI. It's obviously very much a growing industry at the moment, but also there's a lot of fear around it. Do you think we should be scared of AI? I think we should be afraid of people and business models and lack of regulations and lack of governance. And if we are to fear it, we should fear it, how it's going to impact society the way social media did, how social media undermined people's civil liberties and privacy and how social media affected democracies and people voting. Um, So if we were so loose and careless with social media, let's make sure we are not loose with AI because it's just going to duplicate 
um, and amplify and impact on a greater level if we handle AI like we handle social media. Now, is social media like the culprit or business practices the culprit? It's the business practices. You know, who has access to my cookies right now, Siri? Here's what I found. She don't know. She's on the phone though, right? Who has access to your cookies? What the fuck is a cookie anyway? And why they call it a cookie? Why they call the most powerful thing on your phone the most cutest thing where you give access to your cookies to everybody? All I know in Sesame Street, there was this motherfucker called a cookie monster. And even he was cute, but he ate real cookies. These companies are different types of cookie monsters. And so I'm afraid of AI if the same cookie practice and data manipulation is being applied to this new realm that we're entering. So no, I'm not afraid of AI. I'm worried and concerned of people, greed, and misuse of power when today's power is data and another name for data is cookies. Before we end, I want to ask you two specific questions that I feel like will really help some people listening. First of all, if you were speaking to a kind of version of you or like a hyper-creative kid, what would you say that they should be focusing their time on or focusing their time investment in? What does this kid do? Say it's the version of you at school that realized you were really creative. Dream big and tr try your hardest to materialize those dreams, no matter what the dream is. Be audacious and materialize your audacities into ideas that are magnetic. Be ambitious and surround yourself with other ambitious people that can add strategy to your ambitions. Those three, mm. dreams, audacity, ambition, manifestation. You know what that spells? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. D-A-A-M. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me that. about manifest. <laughs> Talk to me about manifestation for a second. Why is that important to you? Because a dream without a path of manifestation is just like an idea that's just going to cause anxiety and depression later on. So manifestation to you is like an action plan. Yeah, yeah. You manifest a dream. To manifest it, you need strategy. If you want to take a dream and make it real, you want to manifest it. How do you manifest? You need a manifesto. What's a manifesto? That's a manuscript. What's a manuscript? That's manually being strategic to materialize that dream. And the bigger the dream, the more audacious you have to be. The more audacious you have to be, you have to arm yourself with ambition. You have to be ambitious, audacious to manifest these massive dreams. And what would you say your most important habits are that have, I guess, made you so successful? It's a gift and a curse, meaning I don't know when to stop until it's materialize. That, that could be good and that could be bad. It could be bad if you're on a, a mission impossible. There's certain things that just can't be done given the level of technological advancements that you currently are in. So if I was ambitious in 1700 and I'm like, yo, I want to go to the moon. The technology was not available because you needed aluminum. You ain't going to the moon in wood. You ain't going to the moon in freaking stone. Certain types of materials needed to come first before man or our species could get off the planet to go to the moon. You could be ambitious all you want, but if the technology is not there, that's why you need to manifest technologies. And sometimes manifesting those technologies take time. So how much time do you actually have to materialize your dream? So you have to be self-aware. You have to be aware of where we are collectively as a species technologically, scientifically, because some dreams cannot be manifested right now. Mm. Well, I think that's a perfect place to stop. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, it's been really great to have you. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in London. Hey, I have to say, this is a really awesome interview. Thank you. Really, really. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's obvious probably why you have a successful podcast. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're really dope. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's very kind. Did.